Hi, Devcom. How's it going? Uh, so thank you guys for joining to this presentation. Contactless overflow, uh, where we're going to discuss about uh, code execution uh, issues in um, NFC readers that are used in uh, point of sales and ATMs. So short introduction about myself. I'm a principal security consultant in IOActive. Um, so I'm a guy that most of his time is doing reverse engineering, uh, basically from bare metal framework, operating system, whatever that can be uh, reverse engineered. Uh, also, I do some hardware hacking as well, um, code review also a lot for firmware, operating systems, applications, whatever. So basically, I'm a guy that likes to break stuff uh, and you know learn new things. Uh, but also I enjoy to find mitigations and solutions for those uh, findings because uh, sometimes it's quite uh, challenging as well. So, so this is the agenda for the presentation where we're going to have some interaction and then we, we will describe uh, with technical details or some of the, uh, of the code execution issues and then uh, we'll also talk about the ATM scenario more in particular. So uh, one important thing to, to take into account here is that all the issues that we'll see here are um, in s different scenarios or devices. Uh, for instance, um, uh, this typical uh, portable or mobile uh, payment device that you use to pay in restaurants or shops are affected, as we will see later, but also in devices like uh, to pay for the bus or the, or the train station, in ATMs as well parking machines or even vending machines, so a lot of different scenarios uh, we have uh, these, uh, these devices. Uh, also for previous research, I wanted to see if there were any you know, research paper or whatever uh, that uh, was possible to compromise the firmware of the device over NFC, and I couldn't see anything like that, so at least uh, back then I, I couldn't find anything like, like this in this case. So. Uh, how these devices work. I'm going to use as an example uh, this device that you have there in, in, on, on the screen. In this case, it's the ID Tech Kiosk 3, as you can see here. Uh, I started with, uh, with this device during my research because uh, I have uh, many years of experience working with ATMs, and I knew that this device, this reader, is using most of the ATMs in the world, in the most important ATM vendors. Um, so basically we have uh, here this case is where we have the NFC antenna and also the NFC chip. And then with this serial cable connects to the, with this board where we have the uh, microcontroller that it handles all the uh, parsing of the credit card or debit card information. But also um, this microcontroller is responsible for the USB communications because this board is connected with this USB cable to a host computer in this, in, with this device, which could be a, a, a Windows computer or Linux computer. Uh, in this case, it would be the ATM computer. Um, so the, what, what we really want to compromise is this microcontroller that uh, is where all the UC stuff is happening, uh, and in this case, through the contactless interface. So. Um, we don't need to be experts in EMV transactions and all the details about the protocol, but we just need to know at least that uh, between a transaction, when we are using a contact, the contactless interface, uh, the reader uh, is the one that starts the communication, and then the, uh, the card in this case will uh, respond back, and then you know, we have these communications back and forth between them. And where we need to focus on is, is the data that the in this, in this case, the, the credit card, uh, the data that sends to the reader, because we want to send something in particular that allows us to get code execution in the framework of the NFC reader. So at the application layer, uh, we have what, what is called APDUs. So basically, <clears throat> at the application layer is what the, uh, the credit card, in this case, is sending to the, to the reader. And this is based on TLV, so tag length value. So basically, we have one byte that uh, indicates uh, the tag, one byte that indicates the length of the packet, and then the value itself. So it's pretty easy to understand the grammar of the of the uh, of these packets of these uh, APDUs. Uh, there are tools out there where, for instance, this is an APDU for a for a transaction, 
uh, where you can see like the first byte SF uh, indicates the file control information. Then the second byte 6A is the size of the entire packet in this case. And then the 84 byte in this case is uh, the next uh, tag. So that's how more or less uh, works. But we, like uh, again, like I said, we don't need to dig uh, too much in the, you know, the EMV protocol in this case for, for EMV transactions. Um, so yeah, if you uh, sniff the communications, uh, like with the Proxmark for instance, this is what you get during a transaction where you have the NFC low level uh, protocol or uh, on commands. And then uh, you have the APDUs uh, that uh, the communications between the, uh, the reader and the, and the car at the application layer. Okay, so one of the first things that we need to do is uh, to emulate the card because we want to, uh, you know, attack the reader emulating a card and send something specific. So uh, at first what I used was uh, this device, the ACR122 uh, uh, device, which, con which contains the NXP PN532 chip that allows emulation. emulation. Um, so yeah, you connect that reader to your laptop over USB, and then with uh, some Python framework, you can uh, send some commands like uh, start the emulation mode for that reader, and then with Python as well, you can interact uh, with uh, the APDU layer, uh, with the, uh, the application layer with the, with the reader, and you can send uh, APDUs to the reader and receive the APDUs from the reader as well. Uh, and in this case, I was using this framework, the RFID IoT, uh, which is uh, very very useful for this, but also there is another approach which is uh, in in this case use create your own Android application using host car emulation that allows you to also interact with uh, emulate a car and interact at the application layer with a NFC reader in this case. So before jumping to the to the issues, uh, let's talk about ID Tech. Like I said before, I started with this reader, the ID kiosk, uh, the ID Tech kiosk three device, uh, because it was uh, uh, present in every ATM that has uh, contactless capabilities. So ID Tech is a global leader in payment devices, um, where they don't they make uh, like a lot of different devices, not only this kiosk three device. Uh, they also make pin pads, uh, touch screen displays, and other devices for. Um, for payment, uh, payment devices. Uh, and something important to, to understand here, as we will see later, that all, all devices from ID Tech are vulnerable to these uh, code execution issues because they basically use the same code base for, for the firmware. Um, so this particular one device, the Kiosk 3, I bought it uh, in happyatms.com website where you can buy parts from ATMs that are, have been in production. You can also buy these in, in eBay. Uh, so this actually was used in an ATM, uh, but also I, bu I bought uh, brand new devices uh, from ID Tech as well to, to make sure that they were also, with the newest version of firmware, they were also vulnerable. Um, so yeah, and as you can see here in this picture, the, in the ATMs, for instance, the only part that is exposed to the user, obviously, is th this case where the NFC antenna is. But also these, these uh, ID Tech devices are not only in, in ATMs, they are also in uh, parking machines, vending machines. They have also this device which also is also uh, vulnerable uh, in retail and also hospitality. So basically it's using a lot of different uh, scenarios. Okay, so let's jump to the, to the issues. So first, when I, I got this device from that website, happyatms.com, what I wanted to check if, uh, if JTAG was enabled, so I, I was able to, surprisingly it was enabled, and I was able to extract the firmware and gain debugging capabilities with GDB, which is also great because uh, for the re uh, reverse engineering process is uh, really helpful, but also for the exploit development process. Uh, but also in the, the devices that I bought from ID Tech, JTAG was enabled as well, which is not great. But yeah, basically JTAG is enabled in, in all of these uh, devices. So then once I'm able to extract the firmware from the microcontroller of this, of this uh, device, I started to reverse engineer the firmware. In this case, it's a bare metal firmware where we don't have an operating system. There, there is no symbols, no strings. Uh, and it has more or less around 1,600 functions, so it's more or less big. So, so yeah, it's a bit hard to reverse engineer this kind of firmware. So my first goal here is where, 
uh, locate in the finger, in the code of the finger, where uh, starts uh, reading the content of the credit card in this case. So there are different approaches here, but uh, what I did basically is that uh, when I was learning more, more about EMV transactions, I, I knew that there was something called proximity payment system environment, which is basically these bytes, as you can see here, that the reader is sending to the car in the very first communication. So I just needed to find those bytes in the code, uh, and I, I found it, as you can see here, and then start from here uh, to reverse engineer and understand what the code was doing. Then, uh, after some hours, I identify, as you can see here, I changed the name of this function because there, there, there were no symbols, uh, as receive car, because I found that in this, in this function is the function where it uh, starts reading from the car over the NFC interface. So, something important to understand also here is that a standard APDUs uh, are up to 255 bytes size, that's the maximum size. So, as you can see here, the code was, you know, uh, checking the, the byte that, that indicates the length of the packet, uh, so it's only one byte, because it's, it's only 255 bytes as maximum. So, so yeah, I was getting more familiar with the, with the code, but also I was a bit concerned, because, uh, you know, with only 255 bytes, you can end up in a situation where you have a stack buffer overflow, for instance, but uh, with that size, 255 as maximum, maybe you can't uh, overflow the other variables in the stack and then overwrite the, the saved uh, return address in the stack. Of course, you can maybe uh, overwrite so some of the other local variables in the stack and achieve code ex execution in that way, but normally it's harder, and I, you know, I was, that's why I was a bit concerned uh, because of that. But then, when I was getting more familiar with the code, I realized that, uh, as you can see here uh, in these lines, the firmware of the, of the, the code of the, in the firmware was checking if the second byte of the APDU is the byte 82 in X. Then uh, it was getting two bytes from the APDU as the size. Meaning that then if, if it's getting two bytes as size, then we can have uh, FFFF as size, which is 65,000 more or less bytes. So I was a bit, uh, I, I didn't understand at the beginning because uh, as far as I knew, uh, the maximum size of, of uh, an APDU was 255 bytes. But then doing some uh, searching uh, about this and I, I found that there is something called extended APDUs, which indeed are up to 65,000 bytes and, and indeed they use two bytes to indicate the size of that APDU. So that was great news because uh, now I can send, I, I, I can try to uh, use these extended APDUs. Then I realized in this case that uh, the function that uh, reads the contents of the card, it's using to store that APDU in, in this stack buffer. And if we can set a, a buffer bigger than 138 hex, which is 312 bytes, if, if I remember, remember correctly, um, then you would overflow this buffer and then uh, get a, a stack buffer overflow. So I, I saw this statically, uh, reversing it in the firmware, but I needed to, you know, to be able to send an ex extended APDU and, and prove that it, that was possible. But the problem was that um, the reader I was using to emulate a car didn't support extended APDUs by hardware, so I couldn't use that. And I was, you know, looking on the internet, like, how can I emulate a car, but also be able to send an extended APDU and the, the only solution I saw uh, so, uh, back then was that I found in some Google forums that um, Google, uh, some Google Pixel phones had support, hardware support for extended APDUs, and also Google uh, released an Android, base, Android version with uh, uh, support also for extended APDUs. So at least um, I found something that allowed me to, to send those ex extended APDUs. So this is part of the Android application that I created, and here you have the, the APDU that I'm sending, which is these initial bytes are following the protocol, but then the, other, the rest of the packet, as you can see, are 41, 41, 41, the typical A's in ASCII, you know, for the proof of concept, typical proof of concept. So, so yeah, as soon as I, I tried the, uh, the POC with the, the reader, uh, as I was expecting, as you can see here in the output of GDB, uh, the stack overflow was working, and I, I was able to uh, have control of the PC register, so, so yeah, in this case, um, 
of uh, code execution is possible in, in this framework with, uh, through the NFC interface. But also, it's important to clarify that in these particular devices, uh, from IB Tech in this case, the Kiosk 3, uh, there is no exploit mitigations at all, which makes hard, uh, easier the, the exploitation of this. Uh, but also, uh, there is no secure boot, so you can make uh, it persistent, which is also better from the attacker's perspective. And also, since we are using extended APDUs, which are, uh, can be 65,000 bytes uh, big, and then you have plenty of uh, bytes that you can use for your own ARM instructions uh, to, you know, to uh, create your own, to inject your own malware in the framework of the device. So also this stack buffer flow is present in, uh, in another 21 different functions in the same firmware that are reachable on other stages of the transaction, but uh, I just needed one, but yeah, I, I kept uh, looking and then I found 20, 21 more. So let me show you a video of this. So let me make this bigger. All right. So here we have the kiosk 3 device. Uh, I'm attached with the JTAC interface, so we can see the crash in GDB in real time. And also you can see the USB cable is, is connected to, to this laptop. And in the laptop is where the, in this case, the ID Tech SDK, the application is, is uh, running and it's sending the commands through the USB cable to the, to the uh, reader to start the transaction. And in the right side we have the GDB. So first, I'm going to start a transaction here, and then I'm, I'm going to use a credit card. There is no sound, apparently, but you, you, you should hear a, a beep there. And then we can see the credit card information in the application. So it worked, the transaction. And now if I use uh, my proof of concept in this case, uh, well, in this case, there is no sound, but you, you wouldn't hear a, a beep because the, the finger is crashing before uh, trying to, to make the beep. And then we can see the crash in, in GDB. So here we, have, we can see that the L LR register is with our 4141 bytes, but also if we execute the backtrace command, we can see that the return, return address uh, is 414141 as well. So there's the, the bug working with, uh, in this case, in the GDB. And like I said before, uh, other, the other uh, ID Tech devices were having the same exact issue because they were using the same code base at, at, at least at that particular uh, layer of, of the parsing. Okay, so at this point, um, uh, I was thinking like, okay, this is, it's pretty clear that uh, the problem here is that this device by hardware and software supports those extended PDUs, but the developers didn't take into account that, yeah, the device can receive m more than, in this case, 312 bytes. That was the, the, the size of that buffer that uh, it was overflowed uh, with the stack buffer overflow. So I was thinking like, okay, so maybe this issue is present in other vendors. They are having the same problem because it's, it's pretty easy to, to you know to to have that mistake, and and indeed uh, many vendors were having the same issue. Uh, so basically, what I was doing is using the same proof of concept that I created for the, for this ID Tech reader. Uh, I was testing it with other vendors. Um, most of them they were uh, crashing uh, as as well. Uh, some of them were stack buffer overflows. Some other were heap buffer overflows because we were dealing sometimes with bare metal firmware like this one, but also sometimes there were real-time operating systems or Android systems or even Linux systems. So um, one of the uh, uh, vendors affected is Ingenico or Ingenico, I don't know how to pronounce that in English, but basically it's a very famous uh, vendor in, in the world for payment devices and payment uh, applications. And I have another video here to show you So basically, since sometimes it's hard to get access to these devices, actually in a production environment where it works and you can perform a transaction and everything, what I did in, the, what I did in this case, I have a friend in Spain where he owns a shop and he, the, he has these devices, so he allowed me to test it, the proof of concept. 
So basically, as you can see here, it was the device was charging me for 39 euros. And then as soon as I tap my phone, you can see reboot in progress. <laughs> So, so basically, in this case, uh, it was rebooting because in this case it's a Linux system. So the 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 the, uh, the issue is in a, a particular library, uh, and so the operating system was detecting the crash and rebooting. Uh, but my proof of concept was just crashing it. It, w it wasn't weaponized in this case. Uh, so yeah, and and I was doing this with another device and another and another reader, and all of them were crashing. Like every every device was crashing like this. Okay, so uh, very fun as well. Uh, several very fun devices affected. I was testing them and crashing. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, my approach was also like once I found that the device was crashing, then I was trying to get to buy one and get debug capabilities or log access so I can see if it's a stack buffer, a stack buffer or flow or heap buffer or flow, and then contact the, the vendor, of course. So very fun as well, as I was saying, uh, crane payment innovations, uh, uh, as well, several devices from them, they were affected. BB Post, this is a very big company as well, where they have everywhere uh, readers, and they were, several of, of these devices were affected. Uh, we CC, which is, uh, in this case, a Chinese company, but they have uh, devices uh, everywhere in the world. Several of the, their devices were affected. And next go in this case as well, another Chinese vendor, but again, you can find these devices everywhere. Okay, so let's talk about the impact, like what the attack, the attacker can actually do with this, uh, these attacks, right? With once the, the firmware of the device is compromised. So, um, well, it's always up to the imagination of the attacker, but at least in my imagination, I have these approaches. Uh, so the very first one is to um, remember we have code execution in the in the microcontroller of the reader through the NF NFC the contactless interface. Uh, we have full control, so we can inject and install our own malware here. So what we can do is uh, typically in a transaction, as you saw in the other video, is that the host, the the, the Windows computer in this case, sends the start transaction command over USB to to this guy and the price for the transaction. But my, my, my malware, in this case, that is running here, because this device has been already compromised, uh, can change that, that price instead of $500 uh, for 50 cents, you know? But even the receipt, and if, if, if the device has a display, in this case, this, this device doesn't have a display, but the other devices have a display, you can put uh, the $500, but in the end, in the background, it's charging you for 50 cents. And you, since you can make this persistent, then all every future transaction will be 50 cents if you want, or one cent, or, or whatever you wanna you wanna make it. So that would be one possible uh, attack the, that the attackers could do with this. Another thing that the attacker could do is um, in there is some in, in the U.S. especially there is something called uh, contactless uh, magnetic stripe data transactions. Uh, where the number of the full number of the credit card and the expiration date date is sent in clear text to to the reader to the NFC reader, so that's that would be in clear text in the memory of the NFC reader in this case. So what what my malware could do in this device is to um, one, once the device is compromised, then every future credit card that will be uh, using that type of uh, contactless transaction, the magnetic stripe data transaction. Uh, my malware what will do is, is it will store those credit card numbers in the memory or in the flash, and then if the device has internet connection, then send those credit card numbers to my server on the internet. Uh, but also, uh, if the device doesn't have internet connection, what my, uh, the attacker could do is then after a few days or hours, come back to the reader, send a special command to the malware that is actually uh, running in the, in the uh, NFC reader, and exfiltrate those credit card numbers over the NFC interface. So now I have here a demo of a weaponized exploit. So in this case, it's an Android device, but as you can see, that I can't show you some parts of the of the graphical interface because um, I can show uh, the name of the bank and some other details. But you will see the the POC, uh, in, without the blurry image. 
Uh, but basically, this, this is an Android device in this case. And the weaponized exploit, what we will do to, sh to prove that code execution is possible, in this case, and manipulate the firmware, is going to show a message on the screen, as you will see. So first, we're using a, a regular credit card. Uh, I don't know why there's no sound, but you should hear the, like how the receipt is, uh, you know, giving me that receipt. But uh, I don't know. Sorry, but the, the sound is not working. But yeah, and after that, then um, the device is ready for another transaction, and I'm going to use the proof of concept, the weaponized exploit in this case. And then you will see basically I will change it, the the exploit will change the screen with a an IO active logo and like saying hey this device has been compromised uh, blah blah you know just to there you go so that that would be okay and the last thing and which is probably the most interesting one is that like okay now the malware that is in, uh, installed in this uh, microcontroller what if we can attack the host that is connected over USB and in this case could be the, the, the Windows computer that is in the ATM because uh, remember we have a USB cable that is connected to the host machine okay so to do that, uh, what I did was in the case of the ID Tech device, uh, I um, uh, ID Tech they provide the their lib, lib ID Tech SDK to their customers so they can interact with the device and perform transactions. So what I wanted to do is you know reverse engineer this uh, SDK and see if they are they have issues so we can compromise the the host over USB. So basically the idea here is that the SDK in the Windows computer will send the command over USB to the reader. And my malware that is already there in the in the in the firmware of the reader will send as a response a particular payload that uh, allows me to get code execution in the in the Windows computer. So for that, uh, the SDK provides uh, several APIs, and in this case, uh, um, when I was getting familiar with those APIs, I focused in the device init API because this this particular one is always used because it's the one that is used for init to initialize the device and, in, and before doing a transaction so I, I, I was sure there that this one is it was an important one so so yeah I started to reverse engineer this uh, API in the DLL of the SDK and I found in, in the code of the API where the the function where it's it receives the the USB payload from from the reader, and and in this in this case, as you can see here, there was this uh, mem copy, where the size of the mem copy are two bytes that are coming from the USB pay, payload for from from the reader. So we can control the the size of the mem copy with two bytes, and there were no sanity checks at all. And the source of the main copy was the actual USB payload that it was receiving the from the from the NFC reader. Uh, so we, I just needed to to make sure that the destination buffer uh, uh, it wasn't uh, too big, so I was able to overflow it. So in this case, the buffer in this case was pretty small. It was 56 hex bytes, and I was able to overflow the buffer, but also the other uh, local variables in the stack, and then uh, overwrite the saved. Uh, return address in, in the stack and you know a straightforward stack buffer or flow to to get code execution in, in the host. So again, so in this case we have to chain two attacks, right? So we have first to compromise the firmware of the reader through the NFC as, as we saw, and then we inject that malware in the firmware, and then that malware that is running the NFC reader will receive a USB command from the Windows computer. And then my malware will send a specific payload to achieve code execution through that main copy that uh, we saw in, in, in the in the code of the of the library. So to to create a proof of concept, proof of concept of this, what I did was instead of creating my own malware and and doing it with the NFC reader, which takes uh, some reasonable time, I just uh, to, to make it quick, I use a Raspberry Pi with gadget FS. Which allows me to emulate any USB device. So this Raspberry Pi was acting as the NFC reader. Um, so so yeah, uh, with the gadget FS, I was able, you know, to provide the like uh, the endpoint information and the ID vendor, uh, the ID product of the USB device. So uh, in this case, I was emulating the NFC reader as a USB device. 
And with Python, you can also you know, uh, send over USB whatever you want and receive uh, whatever the, in this case, the SDK running in the host is sending you. And this is, actual, uh, this is actually the, the proof of concept that was um, uh, triggering the uh, stack buffer overflow. And as you can see here in, uh, in the Windows computer in this case with uh, Win, WinDebug, uh, you can see how it was actually crashing with that mem copy issue. Uh, the return address, uh, as you can see here, is 41, 41, 41, so it's basically my, my payload. Uh, so yeah, so this is the way I found uh, a code execution in the SDK that uh, ID Tech provides to their customers to, to communicate with the device. And remember that, um, uh, so this, this uh, SDK from ID Tech uh, is, is present in, in some ATMs in this case because it's the, the SDK that they provide to, to communicate with the NFC reader. So also this SDK is pretty, pretty vulnerable. They have more than 20 exploitable stack buffer flows like the, the one I, I described. That, uh, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but, uh, but yeah. Um, it was pretty, pretty bad. Okay, so let's talk about the ATM scenario. So, uh, like I said, I have um, many years of experience working with ATM, with ATMs. Uh, I've been reverse engineering uh, ATMs drivers, uh, also uh, the ATM devices firmware, like for instance the CAS dispenser and other devices also doing some USB hacking with ATMs, and also I have experience working with XFS. XFS is uh, the middleware that most of the ATMs in the world, they use to communicate with the hardware of the ATM, like for instance, the CAS dispenser, and using some particular APAs, you can interact with the hardware and perform, for instance, a cash out. Um, and, and again, remember that uh, this particular reader, the ID Tech Kiosk 3, is present in, in most of the a ATM brands in the world, the most important brands, like uh, some of them, NCR, Wincore, Diable, Fujitsu, Hyosun, and maybe more. At least I was able to confirm those uh, uh, some, some years ago. So what, what the attacker can do in the ATM in this particular case so one of the first things, like before, is like, uh, especially in the US in this case, if, if the car supports MSD magnetic stripe data contactless transactions, then the clear text, uh, the full number of the credit, the credit card will be in the clear text and the expiration date in the memory of the device. So the, the attacker, what we could do is uh, compromise the firmware of the reader first over NFC, like we saw, uh, and install the, the malware. And then, uh, since uh, in the ATMs these devices doesn't have internet connection, what the, the attacker would, would need is to leave the area, then come back after a few hours or days or whatever, and then uh, exfiltrate those credit card numbers from the memory of the device uh, using the malware that he already installed, like sending a special command to the, co to the malware, for instance, and then the malware sen will send you back to your phone the the uh, credit card numbers that uh, have been used in the reader in those, uh, in those days. But then we also have the ATM jackpot scenario. So the idea here is like uh, once we, we have our malware running in the, in, the, uh, in the NFC reader microcontroller, we want to, as we saw before, like compromise the ATM computer. If it's running the ID Tech SDK, we know it's possible. If it's running another driver for whatever reason, then you need to, of course, to, uh, to find if the driver that is using is vulnerable, uh, there's any memory corruption, and then exploit that. And then once you have code execution in the ATM computer, then uh, you need, uh, as you will see, uh, a special payload uh, or a program, in this case, uh, to interact with the hardware of the ATM, like the CAS dispenser, in this case, to uh, perform the cash out, the jackpot. So, so yeah, um, one, one important thing also to take into account here is that um, we don't only, if we are working with an ATM in this case, we are not li only limited to the driver or SDK that is used for the NFC reader, because since we have full control of the micro microcontroller of the reader, we can uh, modify the firmware to act as another uh, USB device. 
let's say uh, I want to act as a, the USB camera, and I know that there is a USB, USB camera driver in the Windows ATM computer, and I want to, and it's vulnerable, so I want to target that and attack that, so that would be another uh, possible approach. So then um, once you have code execution in the ATM computer through the uh, IDTech SDK or other driver, um, there are like if 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 you guys someone has experience experience working with ATMs, you probably know that once you have full control of the ATM computer with admin rights in this case because normally it's Windows, uh, there there's just a matter of time to be able to perform the jackpot because uh, the way the way they are designed, it's impossible to make this impossible basically. Uh, of course, sometimes they, they put some mitigations, like uh, as we'll see, if you're using XFS, maybe there's some sort of, of authentication, making sure that uh, your application can't uh, use those XFS APIs and so on. But in the end, it's always you know uh, a matter of time to find a way to, to do it, because the, the, the way it's designed, it's impossible to make it 100% uh, secure. Um, so this XFS, as I was saying before, it's a, it's a middleware that is in basically in every ATM that uh, it provides several APIs that you can use to interact with the hardware of the ATM. Um, so um, in this case, here, as you can see in example, this is one of my XFS programs that I, I use many times in, in ATMs to, to you know, perform the cash out. Uh, in this case, for instance, as, as an example, you can see here we are, we are using the WFS Open API to open a session with the device. In this case, the device is the cash dispenser. And then we provide several details like, like uh, the number of bills and the number of the cassette and some other details. And then we use, after this, other APIs like to execute the actual command and then perform the, the, the cash out. So, um, as this, as this, um, as this uh, point, you you might be wondering. Okay, so did you try this with an ATM? Uh, so yes, I tried, and it was working. But uh, it was in a lab environment, and there are some NDAs involved, so I can't show you uh, videos about it, and I also can't tell you which ATM brand was this particular one. But uh, if you have doubts or concerns about this. I think you here you have uh, enough technical details so you can do it uh, by yourself if you, if you have the, the motivation. But also, um, if you have specifically concerns about this because you are working in an ATM security team or whatever, my recommendation here is that first make sure that the firmware of this uh, reader in the ATM is uh, already patched because there are available patches for, for these issues. Uh, and also check, uh, make sure that the uh, the driver or SDK that is used in the ATM computer doesn't have any memory corruptions. But mo the most important thing, obviously, is to make sure that the, the firmware of this reader is already patched, because if, if the attacker can't compromise this over NFC, then more or less the problem is solved, right? Like, um, it, it's gonna be really hard to, to, to um, compromise the ATM in this way. So regarding disclosure, um, so yeah, we contacted all these affected vendors. As you saw, there were there were many. Uh, all of them told us that they fixed the issues. Uh, some of them they provided us the, the fixes, and we tested that, and we, we were able to confirm that the, the fix was okay. But not all of them provided us uh, these fixes, so uh, we don't know for some others what happened. Uh, and yeah, and we in this case we waited almost two years. Uh, because this, this research, I mean, started almost two years ago, because the problem was that, as you saw, many parties were involved here, and, and the problem is like, uh, since I was testing my proof of concept with another device, oh, this vendor is also vulnerable, shit, again, and another, and another. So, you know, uh, we, we had to wait time, but also the problem is that many of these devices, they don't have remote update capabilities, so uh, sometimes they have to go physically there to, you know, to update the, the firmware of these uh, readers, which is a, a problem, right? So, so yeah, um, that's, a, that's a problem. So, so yeah, I think that's uh, everything. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you.